Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil Live. You know, we don't do these very often, so it's always exciting for me because I have to not only kind of prep for all of this, but I have to figure out how to do everything with the back office gone anymore. Uh, but I'm really uh, looking forward to tonight. I think we're going to have a lot of interesting discussion to all of those who are coming in from Grizzly True Crime. And uh, I, I, I I just want to say uh, to Gisela, who hopefully is sleeping, uh, I appreciate her sending over so many people and thank you. And uh, we're going to have some fun tonight. I also brought, I'm bringing in a special guest tonight <clears throat> with me because this is an individual that we had kind of a rough, uh, rocky start when we became friends. And, uh, but he likes maps and, uh, I thought it would be fun to have him there to kind of share some of his questions as we go. And uh, I want to take time tonight to really go through your questions and try to answer because this this is a pretty heavy subject and it's really disturbing. Already reading many of the comments in here, it's uh, disturbing for everybody. So let me bring in my guest. Uh, many of you know him. It's Gray Hughes from Gray Hughes Investigates. And Gray, thanks for coming on with me. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, uh, we, you know, it's 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 really going to be kind of fun because uh, Gray and I have two entirely different styles of doing things, and yet we found that there's a great friendship between us, and we often bounce ideas off of each other and and uh, and share what we plan on doing and what the other is planning on doing. Uh, but but Gray, uh, t tell everybody just a quick moment about your show, and and then we're going to get started. Uh, well, I, I cover all kinds of true crime cases. Uh, you know, I of, often cover the cases a lot of people aren't covering. You know, you get the ones that are really popular, and then there's the ones on the side that sort of get ignored. So I do those a lot. And then my channel focuses a lot on, you know, like every night I try to raise funds that come in and we donate. Uh, I think uh, I think we've donated over almost, close to $200,000 from the income from the channel since uh, January of 2020. And like 80,000 of it's gone into a, a, a DNA fund for identifying Jane and John Doe. So, hey, maybe they'll have some sort of a, a nexus into tonight's conversation. Well, that, that would be very cool. <laughs> In fact, I'm sure that you're going to end up with some interesting questions as we go along. Uh, I want to shout out uh, to my buddy Ray Kelly, Captain Ray Kelly, if you don't know him. Uh, former uh, detective from, from Suffolk County. In New York, he and I uh, spent a lot of time trying to bring justice to Dennis Wustenhoff, a police officer who was murdered many years ago that uh, <clears throat> we've become part of those kids' family. And uh, and so, yeah, and that's kind of the cool part about these channels is it gives you this opportunity to invest in things that you think are important. And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight as we go through this, because this this is a case that really um, has been part of my life for, well, since the early 1990s, uh, when I took over the Ritual Crime Task Force uh, for the Attorney General. But uh, we, we just I just got a shout out to a, a batch of people who are here, um, th to all of you from from Grizzly True Crime again, thank you for coming over and and uh, Gisela, I uh, thank you again. Uh, she just is just a delight, and I have so much fun when we get on a show together. Uh, and then to all of the profiling evil folks, especially our mods tonight, Don Marie, good to see you popping in, Red Rock, uh, and and folks. Whether you like it or not, when you super chat, it makes the things stand out a little differently on the screen, and it makes it a little easier to see things. So I'll be watching for those. And uh, uh, Ether Bunny, uh, good to see you back. It's uh, it's been a while since I've talked uh, with her. And uh, oh gosh, there's just a batch of people piling in. So this is this is great. So um, let me let me just lay a little groundwork, Gray, and then we'll uh, kind of bounce into this. So uh, what during, as, as many of you know, in fact, I'm going to be, for those who want to buy a Deceive tonight, I'm going to sign them as I see your names come in and ship them off. And, and uh, I'm going to shamelessly again, because the money from this, like you were talking about, Gray, the money that I get from the Deceived revenue 
is going to build a children's advocacy center, a place where kids can be forensically and physically examined uh, when they become wow. victimized. So uh, I apologize. There's a QR code over your face for a second here, but he'll still like this. Well, if you're interested, you want to. <laughs> Or uh, my other book, She Knew No Fear, I'm going to watch tonight and sign those as we're going through and, and hopefully shout you out. And I'll put this QR up, <coughs> excuse me, from time to time. And uh, for those of you who have been kind enough to say, it sounds like you're sick. Yeah, I got that stinking cold that's going around. But, but let me just set the stage. During the Zion Society investigation, which was... A, uh, a pretty large cult of about 150 people who were sexually abusing children. Uh, we, at the time we did the police raid, we had 70 police officers that we hit the compound with. And uh, there were 14 buildings that we were trying to take down. Uh, we ended up ultimately uh, charging and convicting 12 adults of serious sex crimes. In fact, in that case, there were more than 4,000 counts, 4,000 counts of rape and sexual abuse of children. And uh, we rescued a batch of kids. And and that kind of took me from working property crimes, which I absolutely loved and was doing real police work. We were buying and selling stolen cars, and we were just having a blast as a bunch of testosterone-filled cops propelled me into the world of sex abuse and sex abuse investigations. And then I became a cult investigator for the state. And this was back in the early nineties. When, if you think, if you think back, it was the satanic panic era. Mm. And so everybody believed that uh, Lucifer was out there committing crimes and killing children and everything else. As part of that, Utah, because of the early influence of the Latter-day Saint faith, the mainstream Latter-day Saint faith, uh, practiced polygamy in the late 1800s. By 1890, the mainstream church actually discontinued the practice, in part because it was a, against federal law and, uh, and that there were just some major complications with it. But a, a group of dissidents spun off and said, we're going to continue to practice polygamy. And they moved down to the, Idaho, or the Utah-Arizona border and uh, so in the southwest corner, just below Zion National Park, is the place where Warren Jeffs and the FLDS group began, beginning in 1891-ish, 92-ish. And so for the last hundred and something plus years, they went pretty much unchecked uh, in polygamy. And there was kind of a decision in the state during those years that we were going to let adults do whatever they wanted because going after a, a polygamist because they have multiple companions um, was really difficult because the defense always was half of half of the people in the state are having affairs and carrying on and doing all kinds of things and and what's the difference and then it became the religious issue so there was this kind of quiet acceptance that allowed this thing to continue to grow and develop. By the time I took over the task force, we were starting to hear inklings of child brides being taken in these cults. And that, of course, we looked at as a violation of statute and something that we could actually put some meat on the bones and make arrests with. And so I started spending more of my time, as did my team, in the different polygamous communities and the other closed societies. So when you think of Heaven's Gate or Mother God or all these wacky groups that have popped up over the years, that was the same kind of group that we would deal with. So we, instead of calling them polygamists or, or uh, meteorites or whatever from different kinds of cults, we just called them closed societies and we went after destructive cults those that practice coercive mind control and other things. In that process, I started going into the community. And back in those days, when you drove into the community, men in trucks would start following you. And it was truly a closed society. 
And as you drove around, if you pulled over, the truck would pass you, but another one would be waiting on the next corner to get in. They had incredibly powerfully good surveillance techniques. And they were always these dark windowed vehicles. And of course, you know, we were cops and we had, uh, you know, a shotgun and a sidearm, but uh, we never knew what we were really up against when we went into the communities. But every time we went into the community, I would stop at a little plot of land where there were little tiny headstones carved out in the rocks and placed, and you could see there were little mounds of dirt. And over the course of those years, I learned that this was a place that they called Babyland. And Babyland was a little, uh, I'm going to pop this up on the screen here so everyone can see. <laughs> Babyland was a little infant cemetery. And this is the kind of stones that were in that place for the most part, hand carved. Uh, sometimes it was just a piece of wood that was formed with a name carved in it. And usually it said something like this, baby and baby girl or baby boy and the last name. Sometimes it just said baby and nothing else. And <clears throat> it really troubled me, Gray, because none of the children in that community were getting birth certificates. So today, for instance, children that are now turning 16 and leaving the FLDS, and as that group has broken up after Warren Jeff's arrest, they still don't have birth certificates. So they can't even get driver's licenses or apply for a job. So when we matriculate someone out of that community, uh, they have to learn how to write a check or open a bank account or get documentation so that they can get a job. And, uh, and that was really troubling to me that they didn't have birth certificates. But the thing that bothered me the most, and I'm going to pause here for you to, to comment, and we're going to look at some comments on the chat box, was that when they died, there was no death certificate issued either. And it's that death certificate that kicks into gear the motion of state police to investigate and determine whether that was a natural death or a death by some kind of accident or suicide or whatever the case may be. But because there was no documentation, this little graveyard started filling up with bodies that were never documented as existing on this earth. And that really bothered me as an investigator. And there was nothing I could do during my career. But when I retired, January 1 of this year, I decided there's now something I can do. And so that's the whole purpose of what we're doing tonight. So I'll, I'll pause, let you comment while I look through a couple of comments here on the screen. Yeah, well, I mean, I was just looking at that thinking, I mean, um, are all the bodies in there young people? And and by the way, why do so many young people die in that little, that cult or whatever that was? I mean, it's just amazing that you'd have like, if it's called Babyland, are they all babies? Are they actually adults that they sneak in there too i mean is it just sort of yeah so that that that's great because that's a question that everybody wants to know so most of the infants that are in there are somewhere between hours old and a few days old now there are a couple of anomalies where there are some names in there that are people like jeffs warren jeffs who you'd remember who may have had children that were a little older and that they buried them in there the interesting thing, too, is as you're kind of noodling this, is that there were um, about 4,000 people living in the community at that time. This was before the year 2000 when Rulin Jeffs, the previous prophet before Warren Jeffs, who went to prison, Rulin Jeffs determined that the end of the world was coming with Y2K, and he ordered all of the FLDS faithful to move back to that community because that was going to be the only place on earth that was spared, according to him. So I'll, I can tell you where I was on uh, on uh, New Year's Eve before the year 2000 because I thought, I got to see this. Plus, if they're right, I may as well be down there than somewhere else. But but uh, as you can tell, no, nothing ever happened. What, when was but, the uh, last bo <laughs> when was the last baby uh, or uh, gravestone in there? What what year was that? So so think about this: four thousand kids, uh, or four thousand adults living in this community about this time. The baby cemetery 
baby land, the baby cemetery, and some people call it the infant cemetery. So I'm trying to give kind of coverage to all the names that are out there began in 1950. In the year 2000, when the end of the world was supposed to come, the FLDS community had grown to 15,000 as, as uh, Rulin Jeffs ordered all of the faithful to move back to the community. So um, the only thing we knew was that some people said that there was somewhere around 250 babies that were buried in this cemetery. So we'll go through some of the statistics on that as we go through. And folks, I'm going to give you all a link to this story map here so you can get a better idea of what's going on. But uh, can, can I ask one quick question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is there a uh, is there anything in the religion at all where there, it's like an abomination to have a baby between this person and that person? You know what I mean? Where the, that's why these babies were killed, because they weren't accepted something like that i mean i'm just so wondering. that's assuming they were killed versus I'm just, yeah. that they died of natural causes or mm -hmm. uh, of other reasons that i'm going to bring up in a minute the the uh, belief system was that no member of that community would have sex with anyone else except for someone that they were married to and the prophet of the group would determine who was going to marry who so you had to wait for the prophet to say, hey, a little 12-year-old girl, you're not going to marry 45-year-old Uncle Lewis over here because God's told me as the prophet that that's who you're supposed to marry. And, um, and of course, we didn't start learning about these child brides until the late 2000s or the early 2000s once Warren Jeffs came in because that's when things kind of went really deeply off the rails there. Um, so so uh, as we go along here, I thought one thing, that there was a great uh, news story that was run back in 2016 by a local station. I'm going to just encourage you all folks to get the, I'm going to put the link below after the video or after the live tonight for the story map that we're going through. And I would just encourage you to go through there. But <laughs> The ghost stories were that there were about 250 babies that were buried uh, during this time in the baby cemetery. Now, um, in this news article that play is going to play on there when you play this, it's going to also tell you that that they they believed there wasn't 250, but the local uh, organization that owned the piece of ground that these babies are buried on said, no, it's more like there's 182 kids that are buried there. And again, keep in mind, these little tykes, uh, they didn't have birth certificates. They didn't have death certificates. And nobody could tell you why they lived or died, which again was really troubling uh, here. But um Anyway, I'm going to pause just for a second, let you think, and if you have some questions, I'm going to see if there's any questions from uh, people that are, because uh, there's a lot of conversation going on here, but I think mm -hmm. most of the folks are talking back and forth to each other. Well, I mean, I, I don't want to jump ahead like, hey, did you see any bodies in there that were toddlers and not babies? Uh, you know, things like yeah, that. So, <laughs> so you, you, and we're going to talk about that because... Yeah. Uh, again, keep in mind the the age range for these children, and this is what's so disturbing, is these were newborns that are buried in this cemetery for the 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 most part. So between an, a couple of hours to uh, a couple of days of life. Uh, Ann Smith, welcome aboard. Great to great to see you here. Thank you. And uh, um. This is an interesting point from uh, Lilia, and I hope I got that right. Lila uh, Dakota. The babies weren't ki likely weren't killed. There's a lot of inbreeding, so there would be genetic abnormalities. Mm -hmm. They marry twelve year olds. There's probably a lot of complications. So uh, w there were actual ghost stories that I fielded. There were many times that I uh, drove uh, my police car at top speeds. Uh, from Salt Lake City down, which is about a five-hour drive, uh, with a, a notice that somebody said, hey, a baby was born, and they just threw it in the pig pen to get rid of it. 
And um, there were stories that babies were born that had grotesque abnormalities. There were uh, stillborn ghost stories. And this is what's so troubling is I don't know whether any of them are true because because nobody kept records in the community, Mm -hmm. nor, and I think this is a major failure of the state of Utah, which I love, uh, was that uh, they didn't demand a birth certificate or a death certificate to qualify why that little tyke didn't make it. Um, So those were the ghost stories that we were dealing at. And uh, um, as we started looking and racing down there, you need to understand that when you went into that community, the leaders of that community taught the followers that everyone from the outside world, especially law enforcement, were the devil incarnate. And the moment you came in, um, I've never known what prejudice feels like, but I do know what a prejudiced feeling and isolation feels like. Because when you went into that community, uh, everyone, you would stop to talk to someone, you'd walk in the little a grocery mart that they had, and they would not answer your questions. Uh, sometimes they wouldn't sell to you something, but when they saw your badge, they usually would at least complete the transaction, but no one would talk to you. And we we had a program in the attorney general's office called Safe at Home. And uh, this was at a time when I had not been promoted to chief of staff, but I was serving as a division chief over the criminal justice support unit. And so my team spent a lot of time trying to get into these communities and just be transparent about the fact that there's a place where you can report abuse if you are abused. And um, and I would have just terribly long meetings with the prophets of these cults. And in this particular case, the town mayor of Colorado City or the city mayor of Hilldale, Utah, and work and work in trying to get a, a uh, agreement that I could come in and share with people how they could report abuse. They would finally agree and we would show up at the meeting house and not a soul would come in because they had been ordered by their leadership. You're not going to go in and talk to those damnable devils that are from the state. And so getting information back and forth was <laughs> is next to impossible as uh, you you could get. So um, anyway, at the beginning of this year, I thought enough is enough, and I decided I was going to go down there. And I've spent now weeks down in the polygamous community. Still, there are some who absolutely hate my guts. There are others who are warming up to me as the years have gone by. Some have left the cult and others continue to practice. But in the course of what I was doing, I found 215 babies. But again, the question is, there's only a portion of the cemetery that uh, still has any remnants of stones. And we know that this thing started in 1950, and it ended in the year 2010 when Warren Jeffs, if you've paid any attention to his history, from prison demanded that all the members of his cult quit having sex and quit having babies. And so there was an absolute cutoff and no more babies were born in this community in 2010 coming forward. So we're talking about a 60 year period of time for those 215 babies to to end up there. Again, I've been able to find the graves of 215 that I can pretty confidently say these are graves. There's still a remnant of a marker or a mound. Um, there, there will not be, a, um, there's, a, there's a problem when you're dealing with infant bones because they're, they're much more pliable than an old person like you or me. And so in many cases, those bones even have deteriorated and become dust. And so um, it, the idea of going in if you could even get a court to agree to it, which they absolutely wouldn't during my time, Hmm. going in and um, and exhuming all those little bodies and trying to figure out what caused their death is never going to happen. So 
for me, the next best thing was to force the FLDS people to acknowledge that they existed. And that's why I'm releasing this map tonight. And I'm hoping that the FLDS faithful uh, might evolve. Those who have left the FLDS faith will uh, hopefully reach out. But uh, where is anyway. the uh, this compound? <laughs> I can just look at it on my map over here too, while you're showing it on a map. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, the, the compound is located in Hilldale, Utah, Colorado city. The baby cemetery is in Hilldale. And in a minute, we'll pull up a map and we'll actually look at that when we look at the baby cemetery to kind of acclimate everybody to it. Um, and this is really interesting because Elizabeth, I think, brings up uh, one of the next points that I want to bring up. And that is that uh, 250 babies is uh, 2%. And, and uh, first, I was really incensed with the, the fact that there were 250 babies. The, uh, the difference is that when you look at the United States, and I'm going to show some studies in a second. In fact, I'm going to just zoom forward to that. Um, this is historically uh, infant deaths in the United States based on per thousand population. There was a spike in 86, and then it continued to drop down. So we saw uh, pretty high mortality rates in uh, the early and mid 80s. And then I don't know if it was prenatal care. Um, what I believe is that it was prenatal care. We started to see nationally that trend of infant mortality start to drop. Um, in the community, those numbers of 250 babies are actually not too far out of whack with the U.S., except for there's a couple things we don't know. And that was, number one, there were usually a fewer number of men with a whole bunch of wives in the FLDS community they were having huge families. And so um, we, we don't know which families were burying babies there and which were not, although there, there's a statistic I'm going to show you in a moment that will kind of help that. But in reality, in I've had a couple of statisticians helping me kind of look through this. There might, if you kind of twist and tweak the numbers, there might be a 20% higher propensity for death in the community than across the United States when it comes to infant mortality. So that was the first really important thing for, for me to bring out is the fact that rather than we all throwing our arms in the air, maybe the numbers weren't that far off, but it didn't change the fact that these little tykes still didn't have birth certificates, still didn't have death certificates. And we still don't know how they died. Yeah, and or who they are, you know. I mean, there's or who they are. I mean, you know. But this so. this became really important, and that is, I did some studies once I collected all of the information on some family names, and to me, this then became much more important to think about because there were several family names: the Barlows, the Jessops, the Johnsons, the Jeffs, the Holmes, the Dutsons. Cook, Steed, where we see these, there are more babies in those family lines than in other family lines, which causes you to then start thinking about what uh, one of our viewers talked about, and that was, are there other factors at play in what's causing the deaths? Um, we also had, I've had a couple of comments today from people saying uh, they wanted to know uh if they were mostly boys because of the lost boys philosophy, the cult during Warren Jeff's years started getting rid of young men when they turned 16, 17, 18, and just cast them, excommunicated them by their terminology and threw them out of the church, making more women available to these polygamous men who wanted to have multiple wives. And so some people have theorized that, maybe they were purposely getting rid of baby boys in the birthing process. And uh, I thought that this was another pretty interesting statistic is there are 23% of the babies in the baby cemetery that I don't know what the sex is on them because it just says baby Jones or whatever. 
But the numbers aren't that far off between male and female when you start looking at the statistics. So um, you got to kind of start looking at it a little more scientifically than emotionally. And, uh, and so this has been a great exercise for me personally as well. And Sugar Manolia, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> excuse me, folks. Let's see. Um, Michelle G brings up an interesting thing. Think about those in power who allow this actually uh, tell us to our faces they want to save children. The irony. <clears throat> yeah, it, it was really hard because I found myself like many of you might be thinking of thinking these people don't care about children. All they care about is whatever their belief system is. But I want to go on to a couple of other things. And that is in this uh, idea of how did it happen? I wanted to pull up another uh, chart here. And uh, let's see if I can. Because uh, one of the things that I found really quite interesting was the fact that many years ago, a uh, study was done, and this physician has now died, so I can't track him down to talk to him personally. But um, this physician mm -hmm. said that he believed that the children were dying in a greater number because of a disease called Fumar's disease, which is kind of, and you can see it in this, this uh, man from, from the area, but it's kind of a Down's syndrome um, discipline disease, but it has some pretty horrid birth defect capabilities within it. And he went in and he did some genetic testing in the community and determined that there was, <clears throat> uh, let's see if I can find the, uh, the actual numbers rather than trying to quote. Um, so, so here he says, uh, Fumar's disease is an enzyme irregularity that causes severe mental retardation, epileptic seizures, and other cruel effects that leave children nearly helpless and unable to, to care for themselves. And Dr. Theodore uh, is the man who he's now since died, said he's treated a bunch of people like this. But the statistic for at that time, when he did the study, the 8,000 residents um, came back and said 90% of the community is related uh, to one side or another of the the uh, the bloodlines that are within the community. So there is a, a really low genetic diversity there, basically. Like, exactly. like cheetahs. <laughs> like cheetahs are kind of like that. You know, the, yeah. um, you know go ahead. No, no, you're, you're exactly right on. So this is science that can support that there are reasons behind. And, and folks, I've got this as a link in the story map so you can go in and read it further. But I wanted to see if I could find that actual statistic because the uh, percentage was like um, thousands time that the, the, the incident of Fumar's disease in the polygamous community okay, yeah. is thousands of times higher than anywhere else in the world. Now, is it something which, that you transfer to somebody or is it like because they're like so closely related to each other that it happens? Or is it something that the gene got into the population of all these people and they keep breeding amongst themselves and then now it's way more prevalent? Is that more likely or? So I don't know exactly how to answer the question outside of going right back to um, these statistics. And this particular, as I went in and looked at the actual children that are buried in the cemetery, the propensity within these bloodlines is much greater to have children dying. I don't know what these kids died of again. So again, it's like the most unscientific science study you could do but uh but the barlow family the jessup family the johnson family they're having a lot more babies that are dying in the infancy stage than other families is that because they're carrying the fumars disease 
or is, is it that there's a serial issue or what? I have no idea um, other than, you know, I just like to kind of give the facts and these are the facts. Yeah. It's the closest I could get to saying I can see where some families should probably do genetic testing before they have babies, frankly. Yeah, well, especially in that uh, community, for sure. I mean, it's a thousand times greater, I think, at that point, or whatever it is. You know, we don't know the exact number. We couldn't find it, but it was some huge number, right? Like way more prevalent in that community than the general population of the United States. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And I better call you out, Greg, because you just uh, threw 10 bucks in the kitty. So thank you so much. <laughs> That's I, wanted awesome. to get started. I, to get, I wanted to get everybody started in there. You know, you got to have that first person. <laughs> uh, Regina, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there, there are a couple hope, uh, hope, eight fear. I, I've, I've always wondered what that is. What, what the, anyway, thank you for that kind donation. And, uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, this comment by Mandy, I hope it's a very old article. The language is terrible. Yeah, I don't write it. I just share what the experts say. And this was a medical doctor who said uh, that's going on. Um, I bet it's hope, hate, eight fear is hope destroyed fear. Like you were fear. So hope, eight fear, maybe, right? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Come on, everybody. I think that's close. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, Zane, thanks a lot. That's really kind of you. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's uh, so here, here's a, a, a question you popped up. Incest is why there isn't great genetic diversity. Uh, yeah, interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, here's Kristen. Can you imagine living in close quarters with so many people? And for those of you who have been watching my series that I've been doing, it's a 12 part series. We're on episode nine next week. But uh, I've been a, I've been going to all of the places, Gray, uh, in the polygamous community that haunted me as an investigator, and I'm trying to like this dispel the myths and and uh, talk yeah. about what really is happening there. And it's the thing that's becoming so powerfully uh, obvious to me is that transparency would have saved the polygamous community. They may have even been allowed to continue to to practice their religious belief if they'd have been transparent and, and obviously if they weren't sexually abusing children, and uh, and if people would just be transparent in these cults, which cults will never do that are destructive, um, then we would have more understanding. Plus, uh, they wouldn't cut their people off from the outside world. Even today, uh, just. Just last week when I was down at the community, I was talking to a woman who was now 30, raised in the in the uh, FLDS, and uh, I stop and say hi to her periodically over, over the years. I've, again, created some friendships, and uh, she had her phone with her, and, and I said, cool, you, you got a phone, and she says, yeah, and it's it's not baptized. And I said, baptized? And she said, yeah, before, if you got a, if you were lucky enough to get a phone, the uh, you had to give it to the God Squad, which was the secret polygamy police, and they would scrape every ability from the phone to get outside connections to internet or anything else and just leave you with an old cell phone that could get a phone call coming in and that's wow. it and she said i finally have a phone that's not baptized i thought you were i thought they were saying like you have to dunk it in the water and the phone lasted 10 seconds you know like hey we got to we got to dump it in the water there's your phone up oh, sorry it doesn't work <laughs> something like yeah that. yeah <laughs> it, it's crazy um <clears throat> so uh mandy i i hope that one chart i pulled out <clears throat> Answers this question. I wonder if some families have more babies who died due to the number of wives as much as the birth defects. And I would just say, let's twist that thought process a little based on my experience. It's uh, that there are more wives in all of these families, but I think that the common denominator is still that one man who has multiple wives because only that one mother would be uh, delivering children if she was the, the carrier of whatever that genetic uh, defect was. 
And yet here you have a man who's populating multiple wives. And uh, uh, last uh, two weeks ago, Gray, I, I uh, went into the home of Warren Jeffs where he kept his 87 wives. And folks, go back and watch those videos. And she now has become a friend. Of course, at one time we hated each other, or she hated me at least. And uh, and she shared how the women are required to have a baby every single year. And uh, I met her uh, her sister, who's had 17 babies over the course of 17 years. Her last two children died, and uh, then she quit having babies. Now, is that because she developed a gene uh, or that, that Fumar's disease or something else? Probably not. That's probably more in line with the fact that this poor woman was forced to to have multiple babies. I also, yeah, also you know, also when you get older, like you you have a better chance of losing a baby. You know, that's what they sell, tell you. If like you have, you're pregnant when you're forty, there's a way higher chance of losing the baby. Yeah, right? yeah. So if you're having seventeen babies, you have to wait. Like, you know, you could be well. I guess you have to start when you're thirteen, so you probably have seventeen when you're thirty. I mean that. that uh, I don't know. I'm not. I'm absolutely not a fan of those cults at all. I mean, I mean, who would be really? They're just absolutely the most disgusting. I'm not. I'm not a world. fan either. I've yeah, spent yeah, I my mean, life trying I mean, to put them in prison. <laughs> I mean, there's probably people out there. Well, I don't know. You know what I always think is weird is why do the cult leaders always make it so beneficial for themselves? You know, it's like that's what listen, makes you, a cult leader, isn't it? Right. It's, it's crazy. It's like they, you know, yeah. it's all about themselves. They get everybody's money. And they get their wives and everybody else is just off to the side. Usually, you know, it's crazy. Uh, Lady Kara. Yeah. Um, you are voicing something that many women ask, And I'll tell you that to the FLDS yeah. faithful, the opportunity to give your daughter, can you imagine your most prized possession? And people get mad at me when I say possession, but uh, so please don't take it wrong folks. But, the thing that you you value the most, your children, your spouse, imagine giving them up, and yet for them to give it to one of these church leaders who they believe are gods themselves, it's not a hard thing at all. In fact, it's something that's celebrated, which is just makes you scratch your head uh, beyond <coughs> beyond measure. But. Anyway, let's see if there's anything else in here. I do want to say I think it's really cool that you're doing this. You know, I mean, if not, maybe you'll get if there's a, a reason for justice for the babies that you'll find out later. That's great. But at least you're giving, you know, maybe you can somehow figure out, give their names back at some point. Maybe somebody because these are all going to be related to the people in these this uh, cult. Right. And yeah. we, we all know that. In the Mormon community, they're really into genealogy and, you know, so that could be really simple. I bet you um, every baby in there will be very easy to identify if you ever get to the point where you're doing that. And who well, and that's part of the hope. We'll talk about that. Laura, thanks so much for that. Um, <clears throat> and we'll, uh, Jen Rand, thank you. Very kind of you folks. Thank you so much. And, uh, and and like uh, uh, Kara said here, the children are going to be remembered now, which was was frankly my goal in doing this. Hey, folks, and I want to plug you again. If you're interested in Deceived, uh, all the proceeds from Deceived are going to build a children's justice center or my book, She Knew No Fear, which is the story of me solving my great-great-grandmother's murder from 1891 uh, and this one, I'm going to keep every penny you send to me, but this one, it's all going to, uh, to help build that children's justice. See, he's center. even honest too. You guys listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. so let's, let's get back to this and look a little further at, at this uh, map for a minute. So, <coughs> excuse me. One of the things that was so frustrating to me is over the years, I have gone to everyone that I could possibly think of and said, give me a map. Give me a, a list of who these little kids are that are buried in this thing. Give me something that says you cared enough to document who they were. And uh, 
and so even as short as uh, since the first of the year, multiple times, I've asked the city for a map of the baby cemetery, and they won't respond. And so I'm frankly not a bit ashamed to call out the fact that they didn't respond. They might have a reason for not responding. And part of it, I think, is that longstanding belief that we're not going to do anything with the outside world, even as much as they try to say we're now getting more involved in in all these kinds of issues and things like that. Um, but <coughs> um, let's see. Uh, I, I clicked on this, and and I didn't mean to, but I'm glad I did because uh, I just want to say thank you for, for being here and, and supporting us. So uh, the city, n nothing. So the next thing I thought is that, and, and there are two towns. So there's the town of Hilldale, or the city of Hilldale, and you cross over the border in uh, in less than four mm -hmm. or five hundred yards, and you're in Colorado, or I mean in Arizona, Colorado City, Arizona. And so I went to the town marshal in Arizona, and <clears throat> this town marshal is different than the town marshal during Warren Jeff's time, because that group of cops, some of which actually went to prison, we could never trust as law enforcement because they were actually working for the FLDS church. And so um, they were somehow licensed as Utah peace officers. And again, there's a lot of weird things that just took time to get sorted out and people to take a stand on. But uh, by federal decree, after Warren Jeffs went to prison, that police department was disbanded and the federal government arranged and built. And now there stands a uh, police department. And I've met with the police chief a number of times and he looked everywhere he could possibly think of looking and he couldn't find a map of the cemetery. So uh, as I talked to some of the old timers, I found out that <coughs> this little piece of ground the ownership of that piece of ground had changed from a project called the United Effort Plan. And the United Effort Plan was during the FLDS heyday, they required every person that lived in the community to give all of their property to the church. So people gave up ownership of their homes and everything else and put it in the church. And, uh, and the church was called the church fund for those properties was called the United Effort Plan. And uh, you can go to my, one of my videos just a few videos ago where I talk about that and I list the fact that there are still hundreds of pieces of property that are in the United Effort Plan. But when Warren Jeffs went to prison, the Attorney General's office seized every piece of property owned by the FLDS Church and uh, is now in the process of selling that back to members of the church for pennies on the dollar. But they have to do certain things like get it tax worthy and start paying taxes on the home and other kinds of things. Ether Bunny, thanks. And it, it is great to see you back here. Hey, do you want me to show you? I can put on my screen the actual town and you can see that's kind of a narrow strip in the. Uh, yes. Yeah. You know, like I, I could, you know, let's see, I can probably do it over here. Uh, let's see. Probably that one, I think. Yeah. So right here, this is where the border is, right? Right there. At the top, so I'm yeah, giving you the whole screen. Yep. So if you were to take that right where your cursor is right now, mm -hmm. and you were to go north to that green patch of grass, right there. Yeah, and and from that green patch of grass, that's where the city offices are. Is right in that area. So yeah, if you if you um, come down to the high school ball diamond, and all of that has been built with money that was seized from Warren Jeffs when they took over uh, the community. So there's some really cool things starting to happen on that. In fact, I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm a little bit off. So if you go northeast two blocks, all right. So right right in the middle of your screen is the Hilldale City offices. Mm -hmm. So right right uh, to your left a little bit. Okay, Tell right me where I'll, I'll, move, I'll move it. Let's see where do you want me to go with the with my hand here. That that's good. You can just zoom in right there. So, so those are the Hilldale City offices right there. And now if you come down to the southwest for just a moment and then go west, 
that new high school was built with money seized from uh, Warren Jeffs when he went to prison. Oh, nice. And that's the first high school that's ever existed in that area. The first school entirely that's ever existed in that area that allows someone other than just FLDS people to go there. And then if you'll zoom in just to the south of that, to that big housing complex, just one that's the, that one right there. That's the home that Willie Jessup built for Warren Jeffs and his 87 wives. Wow. That's right here. This big blue. Yeah. That whole place. It's there. Like a compound. Right? If you go yeah. back, you can see my videos where I fly the drone around the walls. It's got 20 foot walls around it. Uh, big metal Sally port doors to come inside of it. Uh, but now let's go to the east a little bit and we'll just show just them where the baby cemetery that. is. You can see it looking at it like that. There you oh, go. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Look at that. It's like a compound or something. And it definitely was a compound. Okay. So then where so now, and we're going to come back and do this on uh, my map in a minute, but now just go to the east and go north about two blocks. Keep going east. Okay. How about if I go out here? All right, right. Okay. Right there. That open field right by where you're go to the right of your cursor to the east. Uh -huh. There's a big brown field. Oh, this one right here. Yeah. That's the baby cemetery. Oh, wow. Okay. There you go. Here, I'll put a pin in there. Just... <coughs> All right. I'll go. Let me go back to my uh, regular view. Do you have anything else to? No. I'm not sure. And we'll, we'll come back and we'll visit that in a, in a minute. But that, that was very helpful. So um, let me, right, I let just. Me get... <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's so when I <clears throat> when I looked at the ownership of that piece of property, they had just sold a few weeks earlier that piece of property to a um, different group, and I've I've purposely hazed it out, but um, that group was the uh, grandson of one of the polygamous leaders, and he was in charge of that now. I reached out to him on Facebook. He acknowledged and accepted, but then he just flat refused to answer my questions. So hey, then I, I reached. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, you just have me on the screen in my map. If you're showing something else, if you thought oh, you I, were showing something else, because I do that on my show all the time where I'm talking about something for 10 minutes and nobody can see what I'm talking about. Um, like um, let's see here. I'm I, on the wrong screen. Oh, uh oh, let's. Me there right we go. Now. Okay. There we go. I don't know what people were seeing, Gray, but I was showing both you and your. Oh, you okay. Me. You might be right. We're, I think you're right. We're uh... <clears throat> okay. So, so uh, that piece of property, I could get it, couldn't get anything. I was able to do some digging, and I found out that actually the UEP. Remember, I talked about that. That was the group seized by the attorney general, and it's slowly selling pieces back. That the UEP actually owns that piece of ground still, and. Uh, they're the ones that say there's only 180 babies buried in the cemetery. And we've now proven that that's not accurate, that probably the numbers of 250 or more are more accurate. But they are in the process of creating a 501c3. And I've given them the maps that I've built. And they have promised that they're going to make them public through the UEP. So whether that happens or not, I don't know. But I thought I thought uh, everyone might be kind of interested in in how I actually built the maps, and this is for I've invited uh, all my old Esri buddies to to watch the video, and and they are all uh, geeks. But that UEP on the side of the house, can you see that, uh, folks? It, it is uh, stands for United Effort Plan, and uh, one of the first things I did is I just went out and flew uh, my drone and tried to capture some high res imagery of the infant cemetery. So this is kind of just giving you a, a sense of, of what was going on there. What do you got? What do you got? The Mavic mini, the three? mini four pro oh, pro. I've got that one. Those are amazing. Man, those are yeah. Amazing. And, uh, yeah. and my, my, uh, my buddy, captain Ray convinced me to do this. I put him off for two years and I finally got into this drone thing and I'm having a, a blast with it. But most yeah. importantly, you're going to see the quality of resolution and the ability to put it uh, into a map and make it really usable. But this gives you kind of a sense of what was happening. From there, I had to go out and just manually collect every single 
grave that was out there. So I created some forms to collect that information and then went grave by grave, collecting the point on the map and taking a photograph of the headstone uh, and uh, and then bring that back and coalesce it into the map. Did and any of the finally, uh, gravestones have names on them? Any of them? Where yeah, the so I'm going to show you. I'm okay. going to show you that here in a in okay. just a moment. So from there, uh, we we uh, built built the map, and I built it using a bunch of Esri technology. This is the map, and uh, I think rather than uh, show it here, I want to just go in and and show it uh, live, in and uh, and we'll be making this again available to everybody to to. Uh, take advantage of and have some fun with hopefully. So I'm actually excited to see this. I'm, I'm, I'm like sitting here going, come on, let's, let me see. I don't, get, get, get the thing going. You're, you're much faster on the, uh, on the draw probably with, uh, things here. That looks so, pretty organized, uh, that map that you set up there. Do you do the GPS coordinates and everything for each grave? And all I that? do. Yeah. yeah do the elevations and everything. And you were asking about LIDAR. Um, there are times when LIDAR is good or just uh, collecting in, in different formats. This one here, the most important thing to me was collecting the imagery. And we'll, we'll see that as we go into it. But I've got a little uh, splash screen where people can, uh, family members can send a video and share uh, more about their loved one my hope is that they will actually it will become crowdsourced and the members of the community will say hey uh this is who that little tyke was and why they're so important and uh, this is the map <laughs> wow look at that so um you, you, i mean the imagery look at how nice that imagery is when you zoom in and so each one of these should be able to go over the headstone and see where that child sits in the cemetery. And uh, were there some that were really hard to even determine that there was something there, like a little th cover? those I didn't count, Gray. So I counted those that clearly had some kind of marker in them. And and so if I zoom out here and I go through the stone headstones themselves, you'll see an array, what we're finding is people who have left the FLDS cult are coming back and you can tell that they love these little children that have died and they're putting nice markers on. Hmm. Others, the marker is pretty simple and it looks like this one does right here. Um, well, that's a little, that's good that people seem to know who these, they were then because they're showing up and maybe putting flowers or something on them and, you know, maintaining the graves. Is that true? Um, you see some that are taken care of. So if we were to go back here and just kind of go through this list, you'll see different levels of condition. I mean, some of these, they just have a piece of cement that somebody stuck in the ground and uh, scraped a name in it before they uh, did it. This one, born June 29th, died June 29th. I mean, what cool software that is, because I saw as you were scrolling, it would light up different uh, gravestones over there. Yeah, what so you, I, I, what, I, what the hell is this? this is so this crazy. is called this is called ArcGIS, and of course okay. I worked for Esri and and uh, spent many years there. So it's a software that I'm very comfortable with. And the nice thing is, as you zoom in and out, it changes the view that you're looking here, oh, so wow. that you can go down That's and great. look at these a little more closely. But some of them, it's just so touching to look at some of these and think, you know, little mm -hmm. Joseph something. I'm thinking, I don't, I don't know what that, what that is. Um, it's like a D or something. Damon, maybe, or I don't know. born and died January second, nineteen eighty. And anyway, my hope is that as people go through this, they'll these these little kids will be remembered somehow by even if it's by us. But uh, the the stones are just. I think you you'll find it to be a rabbit hole just looking at these stones. I mean, I would find myself over the years as an investigator spending hours and hours you go to graves like this you know that it's a baby but they've never identified the name or anything else mm. um, yeah so there's some like that and are there any that you suspect exist 
in the ground that has nothing on it at all. Yes, there are. Mm -hmm. And again, I didn't count them on the map. I only identified those that I could confidently say this this is a, a burial site. But mm. um you might you might notice on that map this whole area out here has been plowed over and graved grazed over over the years. I only found two headstones from the 50s. And if this cemetery started back in the 50s um it, it just makes me wonder if there are bodies yeah. here that that we're not seeing and and i just don't know the answer to that yeah because you can see that like even on the map that we showed earlier uh, uh, from my computer that's all one color it's all sort of the same field uh yeah. you have that you have that great image over the top of google Earth, so it's hard to see that it looks really the same there yeah and that's the so. problem is you know you look at regular imagery and you start getting this when you get down yeah. to the <laughs> ground level yeah, versus exactly. being able to go in and now in, in some cases you can almost read the the marker stones in there so um this this will be available for everyone to go through and what we've done is we've gone in further and for those of you who watch the youtube channel growing up in polygamy with sam Zitting Weissen. This is actually one of Sam's family members. And this guy, uh, he uh, he left the polygamous community at age 18. And uh, at the time he left, he had 34 brothers and sisters. And, uh, and so anyway, this is one of his. And one of the things that I thought would be touching in here is to give people not only a way to make a donation to help me keep this thing going, but more importantly, a place to upload a video if they wanted to just use their mobile phone and say, let me tell you a little bit about this child. And so um, I had uh, Sam, when he saw the, I sent him the map and uh, he actually sent me this video today and I'm gonna have to close this out and bring it up because it's on a, a different screen. So let me just, uh, pop that up and we'll play that and then we'll we'll uh, chat a little bit um man that's awesome there we go T hopefully you'll be able to hear this on your side hey everyone sam are you here. hearing that i was born yep. and in the flds community it is a polygamous group there on the border of utah and arizona I was born on the Utah side and raised there in Hilldale. Just across the street from my childhood home is a baby cemetery or an infant cemetery. A lot of people have a lot of questions and have little or no information about what this is all about and who is buried there. Mike King is doing a great job trying to gather that information and get as much information as possible about this. Uh, I have one half sibling that was buried there, unfortunately. Now she was born and passed away long before I was ever born. So I don't know a lot or didn't see personally what happened there. I just heard a lot of stories within my family. So she was very much accepted as part of our family, very much talked about throughout our family. So even though I was born much later, it was talked about quite frequently throughout our house that there was a child that we looked at as an angel that was a perfect child that didn't need to prove herself on this earth. And she was able to just continue living with God. She passed away because her umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck at birth. I don't know if she was dead at the time that they gave birth or if it was, or if it was shortly after, but unfortunately she did not live long or at all. So that's the little bit of information I have about my personal family and that cemetery there. Thank you all and thank you, Mike. Wow, wouldn't that be amazing to fill it up with all of them? I mean, that's that's so cool. that's my my hope, quite frankly, <laughs> yeah, uh, awesome. is that somehow Gray, this will get shared broadly enough that members of the FLDS who have have left, particularly, will feel comfortable in uh, in sharing their story. Are you going to do? Folks, any, I'm uh, going to put the link to this okay, map, this story map, which gives you the link to the map itself. Uh, in the description box about five minutes after we finish up tonight. So uh, then you'll be able to to uh, go ahead and share that with anyone you want to share. And I encourage you to please share it. Just don't scrape the data and do your own thing. So so you've plotted it all out on the visual ones and you you're, you suspect that there's other spots. Have you, are you guys going to do ground penetrating radar in the other spots? No. So um, I, I met with a, 
uh, a couple of people on on that over the years. And th there's a couple of problems is number one, the, the statute of limitations. And number two, the right thing to do would be to go in and DNA and, and positively identify mm -hmm. them. Yeah. The expense is just incredible. And so since I can't get anyone in government or anyone in the FLDS to think that something like that is worthwhile, the only thing I could do is is what I did, which is try to make sure yeah. their names are never forgotten. And well, so how about this? So what if we used? Uh, okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. So, Identifiers International is who I use uh, with Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, and they they're really good at even identifying babies and all. You know, so you could do something if you could get approval where you just one at a time. You know, like here's one. It's unidentified. I would. I mean, hell, I would even fund it, it through there. And boom, like one at a time, right? Because we've already done eighty thousand dollars. We've done, I think we've done twelve or fourteen, you know, fifty. I can't even remember the number. Like fifteen total cases we've funded identifying Jane and John Doe's, but we haven't done a baby yet. So what if you said, "Listen, I just want to identify the ones that aren't identified, that don't have a gravestone, and I have somebody else that'll pay for identifying." one baby at a time. Is that even a viable thing? Or is it just sort of one of those things where they're just kind of. <coughs> yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, I don't, I don't know the answer because uh, it's a privately owned cemetery. The state of Utah won't demand that something like that is done. And, uh, and so what you have to do is get approval. Now, what could happen is we could, over time, if people actually pick this thing up and run with it, we could potentially do it for individual families. But they they're going to know it's their baby there, so that's not going to be right. even a good a, a good move. Um, I just think there's one, like you were saying, in that other field, you'd have to do ground penetrating radar or something, or your lidar thing that you have or whatever to see. And there might be these bodies and babies that have no identification. I don't know. Just something. So, uh, an offer that I'm saying. Maybe we, we would just be one at a time. I still do other cases, but you know, uh, I probably give twenty something thousand a year to them. So it costs about five to six thousand per bot. You know, like unidentified. Yeah. So we could, you know, start doing one, two a year, maybe something like that. I don't know. Well, let's let's continue to talk about that yeah. because. One of the challenges is ground penetrating radar after 60 years on an infant whose bones are so pliable and is difficult at best. That's but true. things like the skull cap and other things do remain intact, whether you can collect that or not. Um, but to me, it's something worthy of, of continuing to talk about. Um, if not, at some point, I may lean on our communities to do something to try to get headstones on everyone that says baby so-and-so or something to, That'd be great, to yeah. at least make it a little more, um, um, I don't know, special. I'm signing a book here. Hang on. <laughs> Man, you're just selling them right as we go. It's a crazy everybody. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to say, so, uh, yeah. For, so, uh, th this Jennifer, I, I just signed your book and I'll get it mailed to you tomorrow. And uh, Christine, thank you. I just signed your book, and we'll get it out to you tomorrow. And anybody else that wants to uh, uh, get some books tonight, uh, please just uh, follow that QR code, and that'll get you there. Gray and I'll <coughs> continue to chat for a, a minute longer, and I'll see if there's some questions that have popped up uh, along the way. Um So, uh, yeah, this, this is kind of interesting. Someone knows who they are. I'd be mad if you disturbed my relative. So I think that's a very interesting point, um, Black Widower, except for I'm going to put my law enforcement hat on this. Yeah. If that child has never been identified and there's no stone to suggest who it is, you might know, but maybe somebody else deserves to know. And, and that's where government at times has to step in and do the right thing. Uh, now, a murder yeah. charge, you, you know, we can always do a murder charge. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that one. 
they're pretty hard to forensically put a case together after after that long. But I thought that was a, a great point. Um, somebody else, Sherry Wilson, said, you know, anthropology departments would would do something like that. Yeah, I mean, um, these these are the kind of projects that people could really jump on. And uh, there's an adult cemetery in Colorado City that uh, also is just mound after mound of uh, grave. And I've thought that maybe what I would do is make the software available for people to in the community if they wanted to go out and collect each of the stones and have it on a live map that is crowdsourced that, that people could um, take advantage of. And, and that would be pretty cool too. Uh, for the, for those of you who have uh, been, been helping me with the children's justice center, I wanted to just pop a couple of things up to, to show you real quickly. Uh, we, uh, this gray is the uh, building that we are helping fund. It uh, broke ground about seven or eight weeks ago. And uh, so that's what, when people buy Deceived, not She Knew No Fear, but when you buy Deceived, that the proceeds are going to help support. And the idea is that a child of sexual or physical abuse, when they come in one door, get physically examined, they have a forensic psychologist who does the forensic examination, no longer police officers like in my day that really aren't trained to, to, to deal with a child and, and get interviews does the interview and then uh hopefully at the end of all of that they go out the back door uh a little healthier than perhaps they came in and uh so i uh i went and flew with my drone just before so ray kelly pay close attention here uh, but i uh, flew with the drone and uh, captured this imagery of where the new justice center is going to be so i'll just and is that the, right there in the same town? <clears throat> this this is in no, this is in my community up in northern Utah. Oh, okay. So this entire piece of ground will be the new Justice Center. It'll be overlooking a river and a beautiful canyon. There'll be walkways so that the kids or therapists or whoever can go for walks down to the river and and uh um anyway, we're really excited. And is it is it something where uh, like is the government helping pay for it too? And you're just yes, you're okay, yeah. And so yeah, we're we're not carrying the load on this by any means. We're but we for instance just bought um, thirty five thousand dollars worth of forensic camera equipment for the interview rooms, and and uh, we're we're doing things like that. So um, it's uh, it's going to be really fun. And this I think I zoom out where you can see the area a little better. <laughs> Let me see if I can get to that. Yeah. So this this is the area. I mean, look at the view of this place. Utah is just amazing. Yeah. So, Beautiful. There are a lot of spots. I mean, it's, I've driven through there and you just want to stop every two seconds, but you got to keep moving if you're driving across the country. <laughs> but you know, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's an incredible, it's an incredible place, and we're really excited about it. And uh I it's just because uh it's uh, so dang interesting. I think I have a, a picture I took the other day of the uh, area where we're talking. But uh, that home that was built for uh, Warren Jeff's 87 Wives, I'll just pop that up uh, to get, and this gives you a sense of how beautiful this part of the world is. Um, so let's see. Somebody wants to order your book, I said. It's the QR code that was above my head. It's right there oh. on the screen. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. Come on. So um, let's see. Uh, th this is oh, yeah. Colorado City from Hilldale looking over to Colorado City. And uh, it's kind of a fast-moving video. But then if I stop right here, that's the baby cemetery right there. Wow, you know, you wouldn't tell, you couldn't tell that it looked that hilly and nice in that area just from Google Earth map from above, you know. Yeah, it, it is. It's a beautiful place. So, um, well, so let me just see if there are any other comments that that we ought to respond to, and I'll just see if you have any other thoughts and comments 
I, I, just think, and, I think what you did there is amazing. I mean, <laughs> plotting those all out, being able to kind of zoom in and then it limits the number of uh, to the, what you see over on the left and you can click on each of the, the different graves and then people can leave videos of family members that actually know who those people are. I mean, uh, I mean, that's just a totally worthy, amazing thing. So good job. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, thank that's you. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can, if you can see some of the comments in there, maybe you can look for some of those while I sign a couple books and shout people out. Um, well, somebody said I'm not familiar with QR codes. Well, what you do is you take, you can just, I think you can just take a picture with your camera now of the code and it works. So your cameras just sort of do it. They didn't used to, but I think they do most of the time. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions in here. You're just, oh, well, somebody right. said, uh, you know, it's beautiful what you're doing with the cemetery and babies. You know, I think we can all agree with that. Uh, but hey, you got somebody ordered both your books, so there you go. Oh, cool! Okay, that was, uh, uh, Kamid's journey. So, yeah. Well, anyways, we could talk about it if it's something that you guys figure out. There's a body, you know, like some babies that aren't identified, or you know, a body. Maybe it's even an adult or something that's just in that area. If you get to do some sort of you know, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. If it's an infant after that long, they would just be absorbed into the soil other than maybe a, a head or something like that, right? The skull. But like a full adult might still be in there. I mean, I guess it depends, too, if they encase them in like a, a coffin or something, too. That would make a difference, right? Yeah. And most most would have been inside of a wood box. So, um, wood box, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a challenge. I, I want to just ask Christine with the last initial K that just bought a book, you didn't say which one you want, but you paid for the She Knew No Fear. So if you could send me an email to profilingevil at gmail.com or put something in the chat box down below, I'll make sure I get the right one here. And I want to say to Cammie, thank you so much. Got your, your book signed, Cammie. We'll get that out tomorrow. And Beverly, thank you. Um, that's... Uh, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, if you can't do a QR code, folks, uh, let me see. I'll just put the link in the in the chat box. That might be easy, easier for some of you anyway. See that, you guys? Another YouTuber actually making a difference. You know, what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you make a huge difference, though. So that's cool. You, you know, you, you you would feel pretty bad if you didn't, if you if you were just trying to exist off of such heartache that's out in the community. That would be pretty bad feeling, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be. So, folks, I put the link in there. If you uh, if you want to go to this link, uh, PayPal. Um, actually, I think even if you go to the shortened link of, uh, I'm going to put this in, paypal.me profiling evil. That you, should you, uh, get you there. Does it show the address when they send it in? Like uh, the PayPal, you have to go to their PayPal to get it? I it, mean, uh, sure actually, get... it actually uh, gets all that information and takes care of it for you. It's pretty cool. Wow. You can also order the books uh, through Profiling Evil, folks. Just go to profilingevil.com, and they're on the main page. The, the map will be there with a link of how to get to it if you uh, don't want to go back and look in the description area, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get it taken care of uh, from there. But, uh, yeah, that's that's the project, Gray, and and uh, awesome. uh, the, the idea was that these kids deserve to be remembered somehow, even if it's only – at this level and hopefully like with that beautiful video of Sam, hopefully the families will come back because he, I'll end with this kind of experience that I had. My mortal enemy in the FLDS was a guy named Willie Jessup. And if you were to go back and look at the videos of Warren Jeffs when he was arrested in uh, Texas, and if you looked at the Oprah Winfrey show and others, it was Willie Jessup who was the bodyguard to the, to the uh, prophets that uh, made it possible for me to never find the prophet when I came down and tried to, to get him. His job was to keep me away from 
all of their leadership and he was really good at it. And he didn't like me and I didn't like him. And about two years ago, uh, I was driving into the polygamous community and I thought, I'm going to go see Willie Je Jessup and we're going to talk. And I texted him and said, we need to have lunch. And he texted back and said, no. And so <laughs> about, about an hour later, he said, I'll meet you for 10 minutes. And we ended up spending eight hours together. And we drove through all of the places that were concerning to me, including, which will be my last episode, a ghost story surrounding a big cave that was built by the FLDS or a po supposedly built by the FLDS where they were stockpiling uh, explosives and ammunition and weapons in preparation for the Armageddon. And, uh, and so, uh, but one of those ghost stories I wanted to talk about with Willie was the baby cemetery. And I drove him there and we got out of the car. And as we were walking along, I told him the stories about the ghost stories of babies being thrown in pig pens and other kinds of things. And he stopped and he pointed at a little uh, grave and he said, that's my daughter. And he had tears coming down his face. And it really struck me that we may not agree ideology wise, but many of these people still had a deep love for their children. And uh, because of religious reasons or because they were told by a, a coercive, wacky leader that they can't do anything more they've chosen not to do anymore. And, and like I say, it might make a lot of people mad that I put this map out, but it's out and they can be unhappy or they can embrace it. I think a lot of them will, I think a lot will embrace it actually. Well, I mean a I lot, or maybe how about if, even if you get 10, that would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah, that really, that really would be wonderful. Anyway, great use. Thanks folks. Check out Gray's channel, and if you feel so inclined, subscribe. I'm subscribed, so I hope you will too. And, and know that it's okay to disagree. It's okay not to agree with everything and pick and play. And if if um, I or Greg are doing something you don't like particularly like that night, then go somewhere else and come back if you find something that's of value. But, Gray, I found value in what you do. I think you do great research. And uh, and I just continue to look forward to chances for us to collaborate together. Oh, I had a great time. And, man, you should be really proud of yourself for doing that. I mean, you've got a lot of stuff that you should be proud of because I've seen all the stuff you've been doing. But this is one, too, right now that's just amazing. So great job on that. Well, thanks. And everybody, thanks for taking time tonight. I never go over an hour, so I've kind of blown this whole thing out of the water. But uh, from all of us at Profiling Evil, thanks. Check us out on uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and make sure you're checking out Profiling Evil audio podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. And before I forget, in a couple more days, I'll be releasing the next uh, issue of the BOLO, which stands for Be on the Lookout. Gray, it's my digital newsletter and only oh, nice. those who go to profilingevil.com and sign up are getting copies of that digital newsletter so if you want to get the newsletter uh, please sign up i promise i'll never share your email address with anybody and you can cancel anytime you want but it's a place where we can share a little more information and if you're thinking about going to crime con in nashville in late may make sure you use the the code profiling evil when you check out and you'll get a discount We'll try to get everybody together while we're there. So thanks. Gray, anything you want to say? I, I guess I, I'm not going to doing crime con. I have, I've been there twice with the booths, but this year I'm not going and I'm sort of pumped because Delphi cases right at that time. And I got to try to figure out how to get there because I, yeah, and I, I have to see this one through. I think they got the right guy. I think you agree here. Just we, we've talked, I've, I've seen you on shows. And I was like, thank God there's somebody rational up on that stage or on that, <laughs> on that screen, <laughs> you know? Yeah, pre pretty hard to overlook the evidence. There may have been lots of lots of mistakes made, but uh, that's going to be an interesting one to watch. Yeah. And, I'm, I'm, and, of course, Daybell starting in a couple of days, I'll probably run up there and, uh, and we'll continue to look at some of these. And I have Corey Richens just uh, 45 minutes from my house too, so we'll be watching – 
Uh, okay. Corey Richens when she she comes up. But uh, anyway, folks from all of us at Profiling Evil, thanks so much, Gray. Thanks again, and we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.